All right, everyone, let's start. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we will be uh, talking about Cartesianism, Baconianism, and the New Science, Henry Power's Experimental Philosophy with Dana Jalopano, Christopher Bass Erickson, and Juana Matei. Uh, Dana is going to give the first talk on Henry Power's manuscripts and the making of the experimental philosophy. Uh, Dana, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. What we are going to share, what I'm going to share with you tonight is very much work in progress and the result of uh, our experiment, our project on recipes and experiments in Bucharest. And I'm going to talk about the making of experimental philosophy. Trained as a medical practitioner, member of the Adler Royal Society, a pioneer in microscopy, of working, uh, working on pneumatics and magnetism, Harry Power is an intriguing figure of the 17th century scientific revolution, and a much neglected one. For most of his contemporaries, he is the author of a single book, The Experimental Philosophy, London, 1664. In truth, a truly puzzling book, as I'm going to try to show today, looking like an impossible mixture of mechanicism and vitalism, of Cartesian allegiances and Baconian methodology. And this on at least two levels. Here is more of a book in the British Library. In terms of matter theory and in terms of methodology, or regarding the interrelationship between theory and experimental experimentation. At the matter theoretical level, Power's explanations are often, are often slipping from a strict corpuscularianism into the language of spirits and pneumaticals characteristic for vitalism in general and for Francis Bacon's Natural Histories of the Animated in Special. At the level of method or methodology, power seems to work both from experiments and natural histories towards raising axioms, and from general theoretical hypotheses towards developing experiments in order to test, amend, and correct. At times, he declares that the whole purpose of the book is to correct and amend hypotheses with the help of experiments. But often he just manipulates observations and experiments in the way Bacon did, aiming to advance bottom up from experiments to hypotheses. And a large number of his observations and experiments are not developed to test at all, but have exploratory functions and methodological underpinnings. I have shown elsewhere that power is even more Baconian than that, that large parts of the experimental philosophy developed from Bacon's own examples formulated in the Novum Organum and in the Silva Silvarum. And here you have the title page of the, the quotation on the title page of Henry Power, which quotes from Bacon's Novum Organum, second book, Experiment 39, section 39, adding, Bacon calls this perspicillium, and Power adds what we call a microscope. And uh, what a, if Democritus would have fed this instrument, he would have corrected his own hypothesis on the invisibility of atoms. What can we make of this mixture? How can someone be at the same time Cartesian and Baconian? Here is an interesting mixture of the languages. I'm going to come back. We tend to think nowadays of Cartesianism and Baconianism as two separate movements, two distinct traditions permeating European thought. We can see them perhaps as two tides, one originating in England and slowly permeating throughout the continent in the second part of the 17th century, the other originating in France and moving equally slow to permeate English natural philosophy post-1650. And we can see perhaps Henry Power as a point of intersection of these two movements, which to date were treated separately. And it is not only the matter of one book, the experimental philosophy. In fact, what I would like to show today is that this book is merely the tip of a very, a very large iceberg. It is not a book put together to look Baconian in the eyes of the early Royal Society committed to Baconianism. It is not a book that kept a former Cartesian allegiance while its author was slowly moving towards a different form of commitment. No, experimental philosophy is, if anything, a softened version of what looks to our eyes as an impossible combination of Baconianism and Cartesianism, of vitalism and mechanicism. 
In Henry Power's manuscripts, these improbable combinations are even more clearly present. And they are so obvious, in fact, that one wonders whether it is not our current historiography that is, need, is in need of correction. Because Power clearly didn't see any problem in being both Cartesian and Baconian. How is this possible? In a minimalist interpretation, one can say simply that Power believed that rules of translation are possible between Cartesianism and Baconianism. And I'm going to show that something like that was going on in one of his manuscripts. A more bolder conjecture would be to claim that Power was really a Baconian in his methodology, working his way bottom up from experiments, and that he merely used Cartesian hypothesis now and then when it suited him as topics of inquiry, subject to correction and emendation in light of experimental investigation. And I would like to propose a term for this attitude saying that he was a disciplined opportunist. I will try to illustrate in what follows some of Power's practices which can be thus classified. But let, let's first look at the manuscripts. Unlike other, unlike other 17th century books, the experimental philosophy, for the experimental philosophy, we have a relatively large number of manuscripts. We have first one fair copy manuscript, which seems to be the one from which the book was printed. It is not only a fair copy, but also a copy that indicates where images and engravings should sit in the text. It corresponds to the published version, roughly, uh, but it also contains a number of corrections. Here are some corrections and late editions. In fact, we have different kinds of corrections on this manuscript. Clearly, power has added to it until the very last minute. Some corrections did make it to the print, some did not. The manuscript is dating, dated 1661. We have another manuscript bearing the same date, 1661, and the title, Additional Notes to be Added to My Microscopical Observations. There are slight but significant differences. This is much shorter and contains only some parts of the experimental philosophy, the ones that I'm going to refer to, the most theoretical one. Additional notes to be added to, the, to my microscopical observations. There are slight but significant differences between the two manuscripts and the corresponding printed pages of the published book. They belong to the following categories. Uh, there, are there are a couple of recipes and personal observations added in the very last moment to the published manuscript, so to the published book, but they are missing in the two manuscripts. So in between 1661 and 1664, Power added some more material into the printed book. There are changes of vocabulary, for example, a thorough replacement of concoction now and, and then with fermentation. Not that so, some concoction remains, but there are some replacements. Sometimes there, is a, there are paragraphs that are eliminated, there are paragraphs that are added, in some cases relevant. And there are some notes on the margin, including some notes and references that never made it to the printed text. Now each taken in itself, these corrections do not seem very much. They merely seem to indicate that Power was a careful editor of his own work, willing to correct and amend until the last moment. But taken together and with additional manuscript evidence, they show much more. First, they show that Power was treating his book as a sort of Baconian natural history, namely like a work in progress in which more experiments and observations can be added at any time. We can see him, see him doing precisely that in another very important manuscript, namely his own copy of the experimental philosophy with substantial annotations and additions. Oops, sorry. This is the copy of his book with additions. Um, in this book, we see power supplementing the natural history of his microscopic observations with materials taken from other books, like this annotation, which is taken from his history of Brazil. It's about the Colibri. Or with observations related to his own experiments or suggestions for further experimentation, like in this example. He was clearly considering a second edition of the book and he was clearly considering correcting, amending and extending what he had in the first edition. Secondly, we can see these corrections and additions as pointing in some direction. And this is what I'm going to show briefly in what follows. 
Now and then through the experimental philosophy, power appeals to a vitalist vocabulary. As for example, when he describes bodies, plants, animals, and human bodies as laboratories for the distillation of the spirit. This is most clearly illust illustrated in a theoretical digression course called a digression on the animal spirit. And here is an example. So that it seems that this cottage of clay, namely our body, with all its furniture within it, was but made in subserviency of the animal spirits for the extraction, separation, and depuration of which the whole body and all the organs and utensils therein are, but instrumentally contrived and preparatively designed. Just as a chemical laboratory with all its furnaces, crucibles, steels, retorts, Etc., 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 were made for no other end by the ingenious chemist than for the extraction and depuration of his spirits and quintessences, which he draws from those bodies he deals with, in the obtainment of which he had come to the ultimate design of his endeavors. In other parts, he refers to the animal bodies as a laboratory of nature, or in the corrections to the experimental philosophy, he refers to seeds as cabinets of nature of which more soon in Wana's talk. Are these merely slips from a modern Cartesian vocabulary into an older vitalist and alchemical vocabulary? Does he use these things as sort of metaphors? Or perhaps he has here some attempts to translate what he wanted to say about Cartesian animal spirits back into some medical vocabulary. All these were suggested as proposals by the secondary literature. I think another manuscript of Henry Power's archive can respond to some of these questions. This is a manuscript entitled Analogia Physico-Chimica and dated 1657, actually 1st of May, 1657. This is quite a long text and it's fascinating. For example, it seems to say that uh, one of the purposes is to demonstrate that nature, the protochemist, act in its internal laboratory of man, the body, as the hermetical practitioners do externally in their furnaces and laboratories, hope that that's the laboratory, as well as we shall most powerfully evince and demonstrate by this ensuing physical chemical analogies. What follows are two columns on which power lists 20 points of similitude between alchemical operations, practical operations in the laboratory, and the operations of the body in the general process of pneumatization, namely the process of transforming gross matter into spiritual bodies or spirits. This is how it looks. On the column, you have the alchemists. In the other column, you have nature performing the same operation, one in the laboratory, the other one inside of the body. On the right column, we find left column. On the, on the left column, we find chemical operations and recipes of how to obtain extracts from plants, how to distill and concoct various kinds of matter, how to obtain artificial chyle by a first digestion in the laboratory and so on. On the other, there are listed cores the corresponding operations that transform food into blood, and blood into warmer blood, and then into animal spirit through the three concoctions of the medical vocabulary. In the medical column, power use, uses mostly, or some, at least sometimes, I haven't trans transcribed all the manuscript, a corpuscularian, uh, namely a Harveyan Cartesian vocabulary. In the chemical column, he's merely using spirits, digestion, concoction, plus chemical and alchemical terms. The manuscript ends with a couple of pages of theoretical and speculative conclusions, extremely interesting, of which some, but by no means all, are recuperated in the published version of the experimental philosophy. Some of the fragments eventually left out deal with the numerical identity and individuation of the body, with the problem of resurrection, with the question of the relationship between animals, animal spirits and spiritualities, and so on. Power himself qualifies them as notional and metaphysical philosophy. But one of these conclusions is taken over into the experimental philosophy, namely that that states that animal spirits are the ultimate results of all the concoction in the body 
the very top and perfection of all natural operations, the purest, most active, and finest particles of all the bodies in the world whatsoever, and so the nearest alliance to spiritualities and the soul. However, the theory of the experimental philosophy seems to be a little bit different from the one exposed in these manuscripts. In the experimental philosophy, although he takes this paragraph from there, in the experimental philosophy, the spirits are diffused through the universe to begin with. There is a universal fermenting spirit performing feats in the mineral, vegetal, and animal kingdoms. The spirits are, quote, lodged in all the meats and drinks we receive, and the soul is the chemist this time. And the soul, like an excellent chemist, in this, labor in this internal laboratory of man, by a fermentation of our nourishment in the stomach and guts, a filtration through the lacti, a digestion in the heart, a circulation and rectification in the veins. What does she, I say, by these several physical chemical operations, but strive all the while to unfix, exalt, and volatilize the spirits contained in our nutriment so that they may be transmitted to the brain and kept and deposited for her use and service. This time, the spirit is not, or arguably doesn't look like, that is made in the laboratory of the body, but is merely separated, in, in the laboratory of the body, is merely separated from the grosser matter it was contained previously. It's heated up in various digestions, fermentations, and concoction taking place in the body. In truth, the published text slips here and there, back and forth, as you can see here, when he says that these animal spirits are generated down our body, or so to speak more properly, they are basically separated, they are not really generated. I suggest that what we have here is an attempt to translate vocabularies, it is continuing the attempt to translate vocabularies into one another. In the manuscript on physical chemical analogies, the alchemical vocabulary is translated into a medical vocabulary. In the published version, this is further translated by eliminating some of the alchemical terms, bracketing the question of individuation and identity, giving the soul the role of the alchemist, and in general, presenting the conclusions of the manuscripts only in part and with certain caution. Such is the last paragraph of the published text, where a, a paragraph where he's actually lifting almost everything from this earlier manuscript, but he is adding. Lastly, I have but one paradoxical and extravagant query to make. And then is lifting the whole story that is there in the, let's say, uh, in, in the earlier manuscript. I'm not going to read this, but I'm leaving it here. Sorry for the typos. A query is a particular piece of Baconian natural history. A question or a speculative theory with provisional status which mostly comes at the end of one experimental investigations. It aims to raise questions, incite curiosity, give some sort of provisional conclusion, connect the experimental inquiry with more speculative attempts to explanation. This particular query, however, is the conclusion of a slightly different story. It comes from Power's previous efforts to translate a vitalist and alchemical vocabulary into the medical mechanicist vocabulary. And that manuscript, the physical chemical analogies, ends with this striking conclusion, which states this was the spagyrical anatomy of the chyle, blood, and phlegm, the mechanical demonstration of the three grand concoctions, so on and so forth. I do not have a conclusion for this part of my talk, other than I need to do more deciphering, and that a scholarly edition of the experimental philosophy should also contain this particular manuscript. What seems to me to be going on here relates to a process of translating vocabularies coming from different fields and belonging in Kunian terms to different paradigms. Now, let me conclude this talk by summing up the Cartesian Baconian makeup of the experimental philosophy. In terms of matter theory, Power declares himself a Cartesian and talks about Cartesian hypotheses, such as corpuscularness, the three elements, and the attempt to explain all phenomena in terms of matter in motion. True, it is an idiosyncratic Cartesianist because on the very title page of the book, he equates it with the atomical hypothesis. But in this, he is not alone. Other Cartesians made the same step as well. And there is no doubt that throughout the book, 
as well as in his correspondence, Power emphasizes time and again his Cartesian allegiance. On the other hand, experimental philosophy often slips into the language of vitalism, explaining phenomena in terms of spirits, talking about the laboratory of the body, which is involved in a process of pneumatization, and I have shown you what is beyond that tip of the iceberg. And even if power takes, in, uh, takes the precaution to say that the spirit is made of very fine particles, there is clearly a departure in his explanations in terms of spirit from the strict mechanism of Cartesian philosophy. And if, uh, even less Cartesian are some of his explanations regarding the spontaneous generation and experiments regarding the emergence of life from inorganic matter, of which we can talk more in the question and answer if you want. So that's in terms of matter theory, we see power navigating between mechanisms and vitalism. Second, in terms of method, power seems to work on the one hand on a program similar with that sketched by Descartes in part six of the discourse, namely with the theory construction with two layers. There is a core of principles and layers of hypotheses. Some hypotheses are derived from the principles such as the one of the three elements, but other hypotheses are not derived from the principles. They are ad hoc constructions which do not contradict the principles, but which are, however, in need of substantiation. They need to be tested by experiments and confirmed. Power's experimental philosophy reads sometimes as a program of testing and correcting Descartes' hypothesis. On the other hand, power, apply, power applies now and then Bacon's method of natural and experimental histories. He often begins with Bacon's own examples of instances of special power as formulated in the Novum Organum or the Silva Silvarum. Some of the microscopical observations are following Bacon's quite closely. And similarly, Power's observations on spontaneously generated creatures bear, bear numerous resemblances and seem to follow Bacon's list of insecta from the Silva Silvarum. In addition to these examples, Power seems to borrow Bacon's method of control variation of experimental conditions, generated order series of experimentations, mostly methodologically driven. Third, in terms of structure, Power clearly follows the Baconian structure of natural and experimental history. String of observations and experiments are followed by theoretical considerations, corollaries and deductions in the manner recommended by Bacon in his natural and experimental histories. In fact, if we look in terms of structure and take the experimental philosophy to be a sort of Baconian natural and experimental history, then the strange mixture of Baconianism and Cartesianism doesn't look that strange anymore. Bacon allowed theoretical hypotheses and he didn't object to borrowing them from other authors, as long as they are provisional and subject to careful experimental investigation. So we can read the experimental philosophy as the work of a Baconian, Baconian experimenter who simply takes hypotheses from wherever he can find them, willing to correct and amend them in light of his own experimental investigations. In this sense, we can see power as a discipline opportunist, driven by experiments and observations and a sort of Baconian methodology, who at some times, at some points, borrows experiments from Descartes, borrows uh, uh, hypotheses from Descartes but clearly distinguishes, and this is the Baconian uh, structure, clearly distinguishes between the natural historical content of his work, namely recipes, observations, and experiments, and the more speculative and notional and provisional content of his work by calling the later considerations, corollaries, digressions, and as we saw, queries. The only term he does not qualify is deduction, which sounds Cartesian, and it is not since he clearly states that deductions are drawn from experiments and observations. What are these deductions and what role they play in powers construction will be a subject for another paper. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. All right, um, so we will take questions at the end, which means that now we will move straight on to Christopher uh, Weiss Erickson talking about um, atoms and preformation in Henry Power's natural philosophy. Christopher, you have the floor. Thank you so much. And um, let me just make sure that I can see what I need to see here so that I don't get 
it's totally confused. All right. Um, thank you so much for um, you know inviting me into this this really interesting uh, work in progress. Um, Dana and Duana, the what 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 you're doing here in in Bucharest, I'm really happy to be part of it. Um, I should perhaps uh, in the beginning mention that I come to Henry Power from a slightly different angle, I think, than um, than Dana and Oana do. Um, my interest in Henry Power comes um, from a by now, I guess, long-standing project that I've had um, investigating the history of the use of microscopes in the 17th century. In this in this um, in this history, uh, Henry Power plays uh, an important role. Uh, so I'm working right now on a, a book called uh, Scaling Science, uh, that's the working title at least, um, which sets out to, uh, to study um, different ideas and notions about scale crossing operations in nature in the 17th century, um, especially ideas of or observations of the um, growth and generation crystallization in nature and how these ideas changed when it was suddenly possible to magnify. Um, so the idea of the book is to look at how nature magnifies all the time. But when this uh, instrument came about, the microscope, um, observers were able to magnify themselves. So I am, I am, I'm analyzing how, how these speculative and empirical um, practices, um, they, they touched upon each other. And here Henry Power really is an, a fascinating figure to look at because he was using microscopes, but he also had very clear ideas about um, growth and generation. Um, and what I'll be looking at today is his theory of uh, preformation. Um, so what I want to do today is really tell a very simple story about um, how Henry Power came across this theory of uh, preformation um, and what it really was to him, uh, where it came from, and especially how he developed it in tandem with uh, his mentor, Sir Thomas Brown. So I'll begin by talking a bit about the relationship between Brown and Henry Power, uh, then a bit about um, uh, Brown's own um, natural historical observations, um, especially in the work Garden of Cyrus. Uh, then I will look at their correspondence. Uh, and finally, I will see how this, you know, uh, in a, perhaps in a similar way as, as Donna did, how this carried over into the experimental philosophy. So when he was 15 years old in 1641, Henry Power left his home in Halifax to begin his studies at Christ's College, Cambridge, in order to become a physician. A physician. During his years at Cambridge, the young power kept a uh, correspondence with Sir Thomas Brown, who gave him advice on important topics of study and how to acquire extracurricular knowledge. So, for instance, in a letter from 1646, Brown suggested that power should conduct his own practical studies of anatomy, chemistry, and botany on top of his readings of both classical and modern authors. Brown suggested that Power should collect plants in gardens and fields, that he should conduct his own anatomical dissections and try to see what happens in the back rooms of apothecaries, druggists, and hospitals. Most of all, Brown praised the work of William Harvey and advised Power to familiarize himself with Harvey's book on the circulation of blood. Before, um, um, so a bit on Brown. Before returning to the Halifax area, where he became uh, friends with Henry, pa Henry Power's father, Brown had studied medicine at several continental universities, including the one at Padua, where he had studied under Harvey's professor, Hieronymus Fabricius uh, Aquapendente. Like Harvey, Brown kept on referring to Fabricius as the main modern authority on anatomy well after his return to England. While Brown did not discuss Harvey's theories of circulation or generation in the first edition of the Pseudodoxia Epidemica from 1646, he added a chapter on the opinion that the chicken is made out of the yolk of the egg in the second edition from 1650. In this chapter, Brown referred to Fabricius's observations of chicken generation, which he would have learned about in Padua, and he discussed how the Egyptians and Babylonians incubate eggs artificially by heating them in ovens or in revolving slings. Now, Brown did not mention Harvey here, which makes sense that um, his work on generation 
uh, was not published until 1651. At Cambridge, Power showed his letters from Brown to his close school friends, and he introduced two of these, Reuben Robinson and Thomas Smith, to Brown. Although much of this correspondence um, sadly is now lost, one letter to Brown from to, um, to Brown from both of them survive. In these letters, they're both eager to share their recent anatomical observations, and they ask for advice about how to proceed in their studies. So uh, Brown's side of the correspondence is lost, but um, another letter from Thomas Smith to Samuel Hartlip, written in 1648, details some of the information that Brown had shared with the small group at Christ's College. Smith um, told Hartlip that Brown was working on the second edition of the Pseudodoxia and then went on. He said likewise that Dr. Harvey had an, an, an excellent tract de generation coming forth, which himself uh, he saw 10 years ago, full of admirable experiments and various learning. So while it is likely, um, given that we now know that Harvey had finished his treatise long before it was published, we cannot be sure that the treatise that Brown had seen 10 years earlier really was uh, on generation. Perhaps it was another manuscript on, uh, on reproduction. But in any case, this episode tells us just how involved Brown was with Harvey's investigations of generation and that he communicated his enthusiasm to his young peers in Cambridge. Harvey eventually made his way into the 1658 third edition of Pseudodoxia, where Brown gave his highest recommendation of the excellent discourse of generation written by, quote, that ocular philosopher and singular discloser of truth, Dr. Harvey, unquote. In 1658, Brown published The Garden of Cyrus, his most rigorous work on natural history in general and botany in particular. Among the central questions of the Garden of Cyrus was the manner by which plants grow and generate, the relationship between flowers and insects, and how plants can be manipulated to become more plentiful through methods like grafting and the use of different kinds of soil. As such, Brown's work was definitely connected to contemporary attempts to understand plants better in order to improve horticultural and agricultural practices. Primarily though, Brown's garden was a natural philosophical work attempting to explain the variations of the vegetable work uh, with vegetable world by pointing towards the firm order that underlay it. Brown highlighted numerous examples of how the network found on trees, the geometrical shape of flower heads, the honeycomb structure of the cells of beehives and the spongy growth on objects found on the shore all seem to be created according to a similar geometrical principle. The same was true for seeds, Brown argued as he presented the geometrical manner by which two leaves always spring forth first from the seed followed by the stalk, which to him was evidence of how, um, quote, how the needle of nature delighted to work, unquote. Brown even had a name for this geometrical prin principle, namely the quincunx, which is uh, the representation of five points in a square with a point in the middle, as you can see um, here. According to Brown, the quincunx was a metaphysical structure, not unlike Aristotle's seminal principles or Plato's ideas, and as such, it was something invisible, although when expressed through natural things, it could indeed be observed, such as in the examples given above. So that is, the geometrical structure of the quincunx was um, the same in its metaphysical invisible state as, was, as it was when it was expressed visibly in nature. So while it was not uh, possible to observe the quincunx, strictly speaking, it was possible to observe it as expressed in flower heads, bark network, and beehive cells. In order to understand this principle of generation better, much of the Garden of Cyrus discussed the nature of the seed. In the third chapter, Brown explains that, explained that the plastic or fructifying principle lodged in a, very, uh, in a distinct, very small place within the seed and not throughout the seed whose grosser parts served merely as nutrition for the young plant or even waste away to be infested by insects. While Brown did not define the nature of this plastic principle in much detail, he referred to the opinion of Paracelsus that all bodies are spiritual in their first state and Aristotle who maintained that generation consisted of the transformation of spirits into first water and then earth. 
The process of generation was akin to a process of solidification with the generating principle rendered watery homogeneous material structural step after step. Brown believed this to be observable in cherries, acorns, and plums, where the seeds were first like uh, was, were first of a jelly-like substance before they thickened and hardened. The exact specificities of this process, though, could not be observed, Brown maintained, as generation took place through undiscerned principle and because, quote, the seminal powers lie in great part invisible, unquote. Brown also devoted space to the size of sheets and the really size of seeds and the relationship between the magnitude of fully grown trees and plants in their, and plants in their minuscule beginnings. He remarked that some seeds, those of uh, cypresses and rampion, were so small that they were indistinguishable, indistinguishable by old eyes and that, quote, of the seeds of tobacco, a thousand make not a grain, the disputed seeds of heart's tongue and maidenhair require a great number, unquote. Brown then compared the minuteness of the seeds um, of seeds to the tallness of oaks and argued that because of the, this minuteness, it was difficult to make observations of the rudimental stroke of a plant. To Brown, to Brown, generation was incredibly difficult to study because it had its origins in something ever so small. As soon as Garden of Cyrus was completed, Brown sent a copy to his friend Power for comments. It was especially the question of whether the smallest state of, state of generation could be observed that Power picked up on in his letter, sent back to Brown commenting on the Garden of Cyrus. While Brown had argued that seeds were generated from plastic principles, Power objected that he simply did not understand Brown's notion of principles and that he rather conceived of generation as an unfolding or enlargement of matter already formed in the seed. Whereas Brown had considered generation to be a process of solidification and step-by-step -step structuring of homogeneous material, Power argued that all structures were already present in the seed in its smallest state. Um, so he says, uh, what you mean by the plastic principle lodging these diminutive particles, I do not well understand. I am far more prone to believe that these fructifying particles or atoms, be they never so minute, are indeed the whole plant perfectly there, epitomized. So there are two, there are two important things that I find interesting about this uh, claim of powers. First, although he did not use the specific term here, Power was proposing a theory of preformation, which is the idea that the offspring is fully formed within its parent plant or animal. Power did not expand more on the specifics of, of this position. So when are these fructifying particles created? How are they created? By whom are they created? But he focused on the fact that they exist and that this countered Brown's theory of plastic principles as well as the Aristotelian theory of forms. As he also put it in the letter, quote, uh, seeds do not only potentially contain the forms of their own specific plants, but are indeed plantarum suarum fetus, unquote. And second, Power did not refer to this original state of the plant as a seed, but rather as an atom, which he here equaled with a preformed plant. So an atom was not an indivisible particle, but rather an exceedingly small particle capable of having parts itself such as the leaves and the whole structure of the plant, which is to say the rudimentary embryo plant in its smallest state. So we, here we see the very, very dynamic concept of an atom that, uh, that power holds. In the letter though, power was mostly concentrating on the fact that according to his new theory of generation, the plant was autoptically uh, demonstrable in the seed. Here he gave some examples of how this could be observed in larger seeds, such as those of ash and maple. But he also speculated that it would be possible to observe entire plants in smaller seeds if vision was enhanced. So he writes, uh, those, thus certainly the smallest seeds are nothing but their own plants shrunk into an atom, which though invisible to us are easily discernible to nature and to that piercing eye that sees through all things. In vain, therefore, may we expect an ocular demonstration of, of these things, unless we had such glasses as some men ran of, 
whereby they could see the transp transpiration of plants and animals, get the very magnetical effluviums of the lodestone. So although he doesn't say so here, I believe that he's referring to Nathaniel Highmore, who in his uh, history of generation had claimed that, uh, quote, effluviums, some by the help of glasses have seen in the form of a mist to float from a lodestone, unquote. Um, but it's an interesting quote because it's not, it's not entirely clear whether, whether power believes this is possible or not. So what's remarkable also about the passage is the way that power moved from stating that this atom plant seed is invisible to us um, to remarking that it may be observable sorry, through the microscope. So invisibility is here not taken to be a definite state, but more pragmatically as that which is beyond our limited vision and power suggests that microscopes may expand the territory of the, visible of the visible further in this direction. The same was the case with animals, power argued, which he also believed to be preformed. He, he says, quote, some say that in the cicatricula or bird's eye, as our old wives call it, of an egg, by a good microscope, you may see all the parts of a chick exactly de de delineated before incubation, unquote. So in his response to this letter, um, Power, uh, Brown followed up on Power's claim that plants were preformed within the seed and seemed open to the idea. It is not improbable, Brown wrote, that the plant is delineated from the beginning, unquote, and that the offsprings, quote, unto the eye of nature are but so many young ones hanging upon the mother plant, unquote. Brown was aware of the consequences of this proposition, though, as it went against what Harvey had argued in uh, his treatise on generation, namely that the thesis was only generated after intercourse and that the offspring's parts were formed one after the other in a sequence and not at once. Nevertheless, he agreed with power, though he was careful not to speak up against Harvey's observations. So he says, Dr. Harvey, who makes eggs proportional unto seeds, always insists upon the gradual display of parts potentially latent in them. Yet even that the animal fetus is delineated at first, though not demonstrable unto, some, um, unto sense, seems not wholly invisible unto reason. The parts are not de delineated per epigenesin or one after the other, but in a circle or altogether as Hippocrates expressed, though to be discoverable successively or one after the other." Uh, unquote. So by emphasizing the difference between what is demonstrable to the senses and what is reasonable unto the eye of nature, Brown was able to save Harvey's observations while confirming the validity of Power's claim about the preformation of the offspring. Um, to me, it's the displacements and the notions of visibility and invisibility that are interesting here. To be clear, it's not the case that Brown was abandoning Harvey's theory on the ground of uh, microscopic evidence. For all we know, Brown had never used a microscope and neither had power at this point. Power's claim, as well as Brown's, rested on the met metaphysical notion of a subvisible world unav unavailable to the naked eye, but attainable through the microscope or some magnification device. This caused a shift in the meaning of the, of the concept of invisibility. Brown's concept of the quincunx and his increasingly heterodox opinions on generation suggested that he considered statements about the unseen appearance of the invisible possible. Power took this further as he argued that subvisible structures were easily discernible to nature and to that piercing eye that sees through all things. So that is reason. So to power, invisible nature was not essentially different from visible nature. It was a level of shape and size to find parts and bodies as complex of those visible objects we see around us. The only difference between the preformed vegetable atom and the fully visible lily flower in the garden was that the atom was so small that only the eye of reason could see it. Although power was already beginning to consider whether the use of microscopes might change that. So at the same time that he was developing his notion of preformed atoms in his correspondence with Brown, Power began exchanging letters with Richard Reeves, one of London's most skilled makers of optical instruments, who sent Power four of his best microscopes and offered him some advice on how to handle them. With these microscopes in hand, Power went straight to work. Just two years after his first letter to Reeves, 
uh, Power had finished all 51 microscopical observations of the experimental philosophy, including its preface, which he dated 1st of August 1661. As a literary work of natural philosophy, the experimental philosophy bore a close resemblance to Brown's Garden of Cyrus. The res uh, d'etre of Garden of Cyrus was to put forth this highly speculative theory that vegetable nature was determined by the geometrical structure of the quincunx, and it did so through numerous highly digressive observations of different kinds of plants, seeds, and other vegetable shapes. Likewise, Power's experimental philosophy also put forth a speculative theory, namely the idea that all of nature's creations consists of some incredibly small things called atoms, and it did so through 51 observations of all sorts of different small things studied through microscopes. Along the way, Power made plenty of references to Brown's Pseudodoxia and Garden of Cyrus. He made observations of the same specimens as Brown, and he even copied entire passages from Garden of Cyrus without recognizing it. Power also corrected some of his own, uh, some of his once mentor's observations. So he, um, he wrote, quote, yet through a good microscope, he may easily see his own error, uh, unquote, uh, in, a, in, a, in a reference to, to Brown uh, and the vulgar errors. The question of the nature of the seed and its visibility was still in Power's mind as he carried out uh, the eight botanical observations that made it into the published version of the experimental philosophy. Of these eight observations on plants, four of them were made of se on seeds, two on the powder found on flowers, which, pa which Power found to look exactly like some sort of seeds, and which we now recognize as pollen, while the two last two were of leaves. Power did not give any re general reflections on the nature of plants, nor did he situate this group of observations within the overall framework of the book. The observations are, are sparse and only included one image which depicts uh, two puppy seeds, as you can see here. Power also continued his interest in figuring out whether ferns procreate through seeds or not, which Brown had been keen on investigating. In the period between the publication of Brown's um, Garden of Cyrus and Power's observation, this question uh, about uh, whether ferns procreate through seeds had been taken up by the gardener, botanist, and close collaborator of Robert Borrell, uh, Robert Sherrock. In his History of Propagation, published in 1660, around the time that Power conducted his observations, Sherrock had mentioned that there, quote, is a great controversy concerning hearts, tongue, maiden hair of diverse sorts, scolopendrium, fairness, and other plants, whose property is to have the back of the leaf lined with a brown, dusty substance, whether this be a seed or only particular mole and character um, of, the pl of the plants of that nature." Unquote. Sherrod concluded that the dusty substance was in fact seeds and that, quote, by microscopes, the likeness of this dust to other seeds is apparently seen, unquote. Um, Sherrod did not mention who had carried out such observations, but in experimental philosophy, Power presented two observations of lesser moonwort and, uh, and wall rue or maidenhair, which both are types of ferns. So these were explicitly directed at proving his preformationist theory of vegetable generation. In the observation on, uh, quote, the seeds of wall rue or white maidenhair, unquote, Power wrote that it quote, hath been the opinion of old herbarists that the capillary plants had no seeds, unquote. So if this was true, Power's theory would not stand, but through his instrument-aided vision, he was able to pr prove his predecessors wrong. Quote, for though these plants carry not the seeds in visible husks, pots, spikes, fruits, etc., yet they are constantly to be found on the backside of their leaves, unquote. So to Power, ferns generated through seeds, just like all other plants, the only difference being that the seeds were incredibly small and placed in an unexpected place on the underside of the leaf. As he later added marginal, marginal, uh, marginal notes, uh, as Diana just discussed, to his private copy of the experimental philosophy, Power reiterated this point. Quote, this seed is so very little as if indeed it were a mean twixt something and nothing uniting, if it were possible, those two contradictories." Unquote. So this description is a good, ex um, is a good uh, example of Power's thoughts about atom seeds in general. They were something in that they epitomized the whole plants, but nothing 
in that the structures of the plants were still invisible to the naked, uh, to the unaided eye. It was through microscope use that some light could be shed on this in-between state. In the observation of the seeds of strawberries too, Power highlighted the microscope's ability to reveal the invisible structures of the preformed atom seed. After making the point that strawberry seeds were marginalia among seeds, as they grew on the outside of the fleshy berries and not in the pulp or in stones, as was more common, Power mentioned that the seeds in the, the quote, in the microscope looked not unlike the strawberry, some reddish, reddish yellowish, yellowish or green colors as the strawberries themselves are, unquote. So here, power explicitly established the analogy across scale between the appearance of seeds through the microscope and the whole strawberries themselves. The appearance of strawberries to the naked eye was the same as strawberry seeds viewed through the microscope. And again, power reinforced his performationist view and his notes added to the experimental philosophy. In the margin of the observation of strawberry seeds, power scribbled down his conviction that, quote, seeds are, as it were, nature's cabinets, unquote, and continued to write that, quote, there are many excellent contrivances shown in the fabric of those vessels, wherein she carefully deposits um, all her sprouts and young vegetable offspring as so many embryos in their wounds for upholding the several species in nature, unquote. As he referred to the similarity between animal and vegetable reproduction in a way very closely resembling Brown's earlier comments made in letters where he wrote of, as so many embryos in their wombs. Power very clearly situated the observation as part of his general theory of generation. Seeds were interesting to Power because they were the objects of reproduction and that close observation of their fabric would bring the observer closer to an understanding of species continuity. So just very briefly to conclude a bit here, what I've done is I've I've traced this little episode of uh, back and forth between Brown and Power and seen how, how this discussion uh, you know, went into the experimental philosophy. I think it's really interesting to see how, um, how tightly this discussion and a lot of the observations are, um, uh, sit in the anatomical tradition. So I've spoken most of the plant anatomical tradition, so to speak, here, but uh, you know, there's an similar story to be told about the animal anatomy. Um, and I think that it's very clear that um, power here is also working through some Harveyan ideas. It's also um, clear, I think, that, that, that um, um, power's idea of atoms here really should be seen as this very uh, broad dynamic um, uh, concept that is not just uh, modeled on the physical work, world, so to speak, but as is um, proposed as a way to understand generating uh, bodies. So generation really is at the core in this part of uh, Power's natural uh, philosophy. At the same time, his idea of these invisible things comes across somewhat simple or naive, namely the idea that, you know, small things are just as large things. They are just uh, smaller, um, and this we can we can see in Henry Power's work, um, and um, yeah, that's that's interesting for the history of microscopy as well. That was it for me. Thank you. Great, thank you, Christopher. All right, and uh, the final speaker for tonight will be Juana Matei talking to us about Henry Power's observations on plants. Juana, you have the floor. See my screen. Uh, yes. Uh, first, I want to apologize for the um, technical difficulties that I encountered at the beginning of the session. Um, I think that sometimes technology in my house just gains its own powers. Oh, that was it. I'm happy to be here and happy that you could see me. So um, I will also speak about Henry Power's um, observations on plants in the experimental philosophy, as Dana and especially Christopher has just done. But in my presentation, I will inquire into 
these observations of plants with the desire to, exp to, to, to explain how power dealt with um, theoretical hypotheses in order to explain the process of plant generation. So a reading of the observations on plants uh, included in the microscopical part of the experimental philosophy, mainly, mainly observations 38 to 45, reveals Power's interest in the state of plants and in the knowledge about the anatomy of plants that can be achieved by the study of seeds with the use of the microscope. Power believed that the entire structure of the plant is contained in the small seed and was keen on observing the seeds of plants and even improving the some plants for the consider to be seedless such as ferns have in fact seeds. It has been the opinion of all herbarists that the capillary plants have no seeds, which ever did rise merely from a popular inadvertency. Although these plants carry not the seeds in, visible husks, pods, spikes, fruits, and yet they are constantly to be found on the backside of the leaves. His interest on seeds is, of course, linked to his interest in the process of generation in general and in the process of generation of plants in particular. Power's observations, completed by his handwritten comments made in the margins of his own edition of the experiment, experimental philosophy in respect to strawberry seeds, something that um, has just been shown on um, PowerPoint by Christopher right there. Um, they confirm the attention given to all the details that can be noticed by the use of magnified vision in order to reduce the theory of generation. Hence, Power observes that seeds of strawberries look not unlike the strawberry, some reddish, yellowish, and green colors, as the strawberry themselves are. End of the similarity between the appearance of the plants and its own seed is taken by Power as an art that the feature and structure of the plant are present in the seed. At the first reading, this position looks like an argument for the preference theory of plant generation. But Power's own comments scribbled down on his own copy of, of experimental philosophy mentions that, and like the seeds, are as it were nature's cabinets. And of course, the different reading of Power's own comment in experimental philosophy may hint to the idea that being the nature's cabinet, the seed is the place where nature operates diverse combinations and produces new things. Given this tension, I suggest that in experimental philosophy, Power's preference theory of generation of plants is still mixed with widest influences that, as you see, I'm sorry, point to the action of spirits on matter. This combination does not result only from Power's comments and his published edition of the experimental philosophy. It is also present in chapter 51 to 50. Microscopical observations of plants allowed power to go deeper in the world of small entities of matter in inquiring their composition, structure, and function. In observation 47, the small dust or powder on the planets of lilies, power claims to have seen the and I call the every atom very distinctly to be of an older figure, exactly like some sort of seeds. Therefore, the enlarged vision offered by the microscope is not just a manner to go into the anatomy of plants, their structure and functioning, but it is also a way to observe the manner of plants are made of. The similarity between atoms and seeds may hint to the Lucretian doctrine of atoms as seeds with, with creative power in matter, a doctrine that received attention among people in Cambridge and to whom power was connected by Henry the power's ambition was to be able to empirically prove the hypothesis of the existence of atoms to observe them by the use of the enlarged vision offered by the microscope and to describe their properties. Lastly, many more hints might be taken from the formal observations to make the anatomical the, the atomical hypothesis, which I am confident will receive from the microscope some further advantage and illustration not only as to its first universal matter atoms, but also as to the necessary attributes or essential properties of them as motion, figure, magnetic, water, and disposition of them in several contexts of the world. This statement is part of the last observation included in the book of microscopical observations, mainly observation 51, of aromatical, electrical, and magnetical 
infections. In contrast with the other observations in the first group of experiments, the philosophy observation 51 is rather a theoretical exposition of powers as a position about the entities of matter and the natural processes they are involved in. If we consider powers committed to a data observation, we may assume that this theoretical part included in the first group of experiment in philosophy is the result of a process of generalization based on his observations made by the most matter. The title of the observation 51 and the first paragraph of it show the reader that Power's intention has been to investigate the rather subtle part of nature, that of Ephelia, and what he calls the spiritual aspect of matter. In its quest, um, uh, in his quest of making visible the nature and action of Ephelia, the microscopical investigation of these components of nature will be able to clarify theoretical aspects of the important debates of the time in the domain of natural philosophy, namely what power calls, and I quote, the controversy between the peripatetic and atomical philosophers. Although favoring a particularian approach of the nature of Ephelia, power agrees with Thomas Brown's position and his doctrine. Wana, Wana, can I interrupt you for a second? We hear some interference on your microphone. There might be some phone okay, or some I, other... I will use, I will use... Okay, that. great. And I think this should solve the problem. Is it better now? Not really. There might, do you have a phone somewhere around or something? No, that... I don't. I have two computers. That's all I have. I don't have a phone here. No. Can you can you I mute don't. the com Can you mute the sound on the computer that you are not using on Zoom? Uh, it is muted. The only computer that has sound on is my is the computer that I'm using for Zoom. So I'm sorry. Do you hear any noise? I don't, and I hear you perfectly well. I see. Okay, then that's it. I'm, we... I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. Although favoring the corpuscularian approach of the nature of effluvia, power agrees with Thomas Brown, Brown's position on this doctrine rather arguing for the seminal action of seeds dispersed in matter and the films to the study of the fluvia of atoms by the use of the microscope will disclose important knowledge about nature. According to power, nature is made of grosser matter, atoms, and spiritual matter, an ethereal substance, also corporeal, but made of particles that have a subtle nature. Atoms are the last division of matter and have properties like motion, figure, magnetic order, and disposition in concrete, and power was confident that the perfection of the microscope will facilitate the observation of this ultimate division of matter, clarifying some of the most, import most important questions of natural, philosophy, of natural philosophy and being able to further, in a Baconian fashion, the great axioms of nature. And um, uh, the emphasis is mine here, and I, I'm going to ask you to wait just that because time purposes. The eye of the understanding, says he, is like the eye of the sense. For as you may see great objects through small trends or leaves, so you may see great axioms of nature through small and contemptible instances and experiments. If atoms are the last division of matter according to power, the ethereal substance in turn was the first creation of nature, which, which diffused spirits all over the universe and in all bodies of the world. Spiritual matter is the main agent in natural processes, having the role to trigger and maintain processes like fermentation and concretion in the case of minerals, vegetation and maturation in the case of vegetal bodies, life, sense, and motion in the case of animals. First then, we have not those narrow conceptions of the subtle spirits to think that they are only included within the bodies of animals or generated, much less created there, but we do believe that they are universally diffused throughout all bodies in the world and that nature at first created this ethereal substance or subtle particles and diffused them throughout the universe to give fermentation and completion to minerals, 
vegetation and maturation to plants, life, sense, and motion to animals. And indeed, to be the main, though invisible agent in all natures, three kingdoms, mineral, vegetal, and animal. Spirits, according to power, have a restless activity and the tendency to escape the gross matter where they are immersed and to unite with their natural spiritual matter dispersed in the universe. Spirits, says power, are imprisoned in natural bodies under three states. In the state, state of fixation, spirits are mixed with gross particles of matter and they hardly can separate from it, like in the case of minerals. In the state of fusion, spirits have a little bit of liberty and they are somehow in the middle way to escape and become volatile, like in the case of half fruit and fruits or liquors. In the state of volatilization, spirits are almost volatile, conquering the restless battle with gross and matter and ready to fly away, like in the case of wine at its utmost state of fermentation. The restless action of spirits produces heat and set up in motion the process of fermentation that will lead, on one hand, to the creation of mineral, vegetal, and animal bodies, and on the other hand, will set spirits free from their grosser matter, grosser matter prison. So this is how power explains the germination of bra brains of body. The action of spirits in grosser matter will generate fermentation and heat. Thus, effluvia and steams of subtle atoms will pass from spirits to grosser particles, making the latter to shoot forth, forth into spirals. In the animal kingdom, the process of generation is explained by the use of reaction of the animal spirit, described by power as, and I quote, the most volatile, pure particle and active atom of the blood, end of quote. Being the ultimate result of all concoctions in the human body, the animal spirit is the instrument of the human soul in operations such as sense and motion, and, the, and I quote again, the immediate, immediate corporeal instrument of conveying the images of things in the brain. Power's description of spirits as struggling in gross and matter and thus creating diverse natural bodies resemble the great Renaissance theories of spirits and appetites of matter present in the works of Francis Bacon and Thomas Brown. To mention just two authors acknowledged by power in this part of experimental philosophy. This is not the only point, point in which the three authors met. All of them favored a view of nature that captures the continuity behind its divisions into mineral, vegetal, and animal kingdoms. In Bacon's view, the distinction between non-living bodies, such as minerals, and living ones, such as animals, including humans, is based on the organization of the spirits inside the living bodies. Thomas Brown, in turn, argued for a stronger continuity in nature, claiming that every plant produces several insects. This point is taken over by power that supplements it with the claim that the fluvia perspired out, out of plants breeds the insects thus produced. All vegetables whatsoever produce their several insects. I shall not deny that the effluvians that continually perspire out of all plants whatsoever may advantage and promote the nutrition of the little insect that breeds therein. Also, all the three authors were interested in conducting quantitative experiments meant to reveal the complex process of vegetation of plants. In this respect, all the three of them described experiments with plants put into humid environments. The point, uh, uh, um, the point was to make measurements regarding the plant's weight and to correlate the obtained results with different phases of their fundamental process of vegetation. In Silva Silvarum, for instance, Bacon describes an experiment in which onions are hung in the air and refers to onions uh, uh, in some humid environments to inquire if they can sprout. Brown, on the other hand, in regard to sirens, also refers to onions set somewhere outside Earth, but he relates the experiment to odors of Lufia emanated by the, in the air by the vegetables while they spring and put forth shoots. Power took up these experiments and made his own inquiries into the manifestation of exhalations of effluvia via the process of perspiration of plants. At the beginning of the experiment, power weighed an onion that was hung in the air 
during the time of observation as a result of the fluvia, the onion sprouted a shoot. Paul weighted the onion again at the end of the experiment and he observed that it lost some of its weight and then concluded, like Brown, that the loss was the result of its exhalation or perspiration. For that all vegetables have a constant perspiration, the continual dispersion of their odor makes up. Besides an experimental eviction, I shall give you by the singular experiment. 23rd of February, we weight on an onion exactly to two ounces, two struggles and a half. I'm hanging it up till the 6th of May, next following, at which time it has sprouted out a long shoot. We then, upon a reponderation of it, had lost never two drams of its former weight, which, has ex which was exhaled by insensible transpiration. For power, plants are an important part of study in the chain of natural bodies. And it seems that sometimes they serve the purpose of our investigator to explain the kind of continuity in nature. Hence, power introduces a property to plants that looks rather borrowed from the realm of animals. The property in case is called by power natural sensation. Due to natural sensation, plants know what is good and what is bad for, bad for them says power. This is the step forward made by power in comparison to Bacon that limited plants' properties to perception, but denied that plants have senses. Although power departs from Bacon's matter theoretical assumptions regarding the appetites of plants by claiming that plants have senses, however limited the action of the senses is compared to what he identifies as animal sensation. And from Brown's theory of seminal generation by introducing atoms, the three authors met in a methodological aspect. They all favored the method of investigation in natural philosophy and were willing to support their case with observational and experimental evidences. These, in Bauer's words, these are the days that must lay a new foundation of a more magnificent philosophy, never to be, never to be overthrown, that will empirically and sensibly canvas the phenomena of nature reducing the causes of things from such original nature, as we observe are producible by art and an infallible demonstration of method. And certainly this is the way and no other to build a true and permanent philosophy. To conclude, the experiments with plants included in experimental philosophy and also the theoretical assumptions presented in observation 51 point to power's continual interest to explain the structure and function as well as their process of generation. The constant tension between Cartesian corpus Fulerianism and the sort of vitalist approach to nature that is able to create and breed diverse things, sometimes even spontaneously, such in the case of insects, insects produced out of vegetables, testifies that his preference theory of generation was not that clear cut. I also suggest that Power did not want to reconcile Cartesian Levianist with a Neoplatonic approach to spiritual matter, but rather to clarify with the help offered by microscopical observations, whenever possible, the nature of seeds and their role in the process of generation of plants, whether containers of the ultimate division of matter, atoms, or cabinets, laboratories where nature produced diverse and Thank you, Juana. All right. Um, if you have questions, raise your hand or drop a line in the chat. Uh, Gideon has both uh, applause in the hand, so please go on. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for all the talks. Um, I actually have a question for everybody, but let me just start with one for Dana. Um, actually, it's a two part question. So the first part is about these manuscripts and the changes that don't make it in to the um, published edition. I'd be curious if you have a sense of uh, why they didn't make it in. Were they um, uh, is there something different about them? Is there some question about the publisher not including additional changes? Um, and then uh, totally unrelated to this about powers and this idea of a kind of Cartesianism that's at stake uh, along with 
uh, Baconianism as the two sort of counterpoints. I mean, part of me is curious about what counts as Cartesianism and who speaks for Descartes and Cartesianism in 1657 and so on. Uh, and the figure that most comes to my mind is probably Regius. Uh, there are specific experiments of Regius from the fundamentals of medicine that make it into Powers' work. Um, and I'd be curious if you have a, a sense of who is the sort of leading light in Powers' mind for Cartesianism. Right, great. Uh, to start with your second question, I don't know yet. That's my next step. Um, we know we have a list of Powers' books. So we know what Descartes he had in the library and in principle he had all the all the cards, or most of the cards. So he was reading the cards words directly. Um, it was also at the time, I mean, he was he was at Cambridge with Henry Moore. It was also at the time when the card was discussed. Many of his remarks on the card, I could find at least the gist of that remark in the correspondence between Samuel Hartley and uh, Henry Moore with respect to Descartes in 1649. So at some point, Henry Moore, Henry Moore is sent William Petty's criticisms to Descartes and Henry Moore responds that he doesn't take all this experimental philosophy very seriously, but the microscope might, might bring evidence to the existence of Descartes' second element or third element. So in a way, this is the, it's a very vague Cartesianism plus, and, and, and when he's quoting the cards hypothesis, he's quoting the, the, the explanation of magnetism in the magnetist part. There's a fantastic experiment, which ends with saying that we might, uh, we might see with a microscope a perpetual mode, motion of the fluid elements in, in the card. It's actually okay. So let me let me put this more seriously. So one of the experiments in the one of the observations in the experimental philosophy. Um, it's a very. I, I wanted to talk about this, but I I thought I I would not have time. So in short, the idea is that he's observing mites, animals generated in vinegar, something that many people were doing at that time. And then the experiment is a failed experiment because as, an, as a spontaneous generation experiment, Powell recognized its failure. And he's saying, I have experimented with all sorts of vinegar, both watery vinegar and strong vinegar. Some are generating these mites. Some are not generating mites. I tried to put into that vinegar all sorts of chemical substances to see what kills the mites, what doesn't kill the mite. I have boiled them. I've frozen them. If you freeze the sample, when it thaws, you still have life in it. But if you boil them, it doesn't have life in it. On the margin, on, the, on his copy of the experimental philosophy, on the margin, he's adding all sorts of ideas of what he can do, in what way he can vary this experiment. So it's really clearly Baconian experiencia literata at work, how to play around to figure out in what way these creatures are generated and what are the experimental conditions in which the creatures are generated. And it's a failure. And the end of it is very surprising because he's saying that one thing you know for sure is that if you, if, so you put some, some drops of what, some drops of vinegar under the microscope and you see the creature swimming. And, and if, for example, that evaporates, the creatures are not moving anymore. If it's if it if it's if you froze it, the creatures are not moving anymore. And he's saying, well, this is a this is a demonstration, this is a kind of argument, this is a proof, evidence for Descartes' hypothesis of the perpetual motion of the second element. So it's like you know it's like seeing the Brownian motion in the 17th century he's kind of dropping completely what he had in mind about spontaneous generation and says, well, something you can infer from this experiment that the fluid element is always in motion. So that's the kind of Cartesianism. Very, in this way, I was saying that he's a disciplined opportunism, opportunists. He can draw 
an interesting conclusion out of a failed experiment, but in a you know in a very kind of regular and disciplined manner. What didn't make in that's also connected with Cartesian. So I found a fantastic part of this manuscript from 1654, in which there is a discussion of a very so here is here is a very interesting thing. Um, for someone like Bacon, spirit is continuously generated from matter. Tangible matter becomes spirit. And this is a continuous and irreversible process in the universe. The universe becomes more and more ratified. But Descartes doesn't have a concept of ratification and condensation. So for Descartes, a continuous generation of spirit will be against the general law of conservation of matter because the universe is kind of fixed. The block universe is fixed, even if it is kind of indefinite, it's fixed. And if you continuously generate spirit, that means that it's kind of expanding. So you cannot have a continuous generation of spirit, or there is a problem with a continuous generation of spirit in Cartesian terms. And in this, in this manuscript, he is kind of thinking in terms of if the human body produces spirit, so transforms tangible matter into spirit and all these concoctions are producing spirit and so on, then we have a problem of identity and individuation. And he's using the, he's using the Cartesian terms, numerical individuation, numerical identity. The human body is not the same as it used to be because it has transformed. So the human body is like a machine in which food enters, food is transformed into spirits, everything transforms into spirits. So he says at the end, after a short while, no particle of the original body is in the body anymore in same way in which in Francis Drake's ship, which is harbored at Plymouth, no plank is the original plank anymore. And here you are in the middle of a problem of individuation, which is extremely Cartesian. And this thing doesn't get into the published version. Okay, and he is commenting at the end of this, saying that this is notional and metaphysical. So that's why it doesn't it, that's why he doesn't take it into a book called Na Experimental Philosophy. So as a as a short answer to your question, he's very careful to keep to the experimental philosophy program and leave out metaphysical speculations. And I think he's also careful with uh, bringing in too much of this generating spirit, transmutation, transformations that is in a way anti-Cartesian. Christopher, go ahead. Hi, yeah, if I can just drop in here, uh, thanks. Gideon for the question and also it made me think about you know the role I think I mean to me it's a really puzzle or a riddle the the role of Descartes or the role of Cartesianism in, in Henry Power because he seems to push it so much and yet you're left a bit with the feeling like but what is it really I mean what's what is his Cartesianism um and it, it's 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 not very clear at least to me um I think one thing is that, um, and it's some so perhaps this kind of like overdetermines um, the work uh, in some way is that he seems to connect microscopy with Cartesianism, um, and um, there is this um, you know this poem um, um, he wrote a poem on like a recommendation or a commendation on the microscope, and there he also emphasizes some of the ideas that are also presented on you know the idea that you can actually come to see atoms. Um, atom, is, of course, is a kind of like a heterodox, a Cartesian um, concept here, but the idea is that you can see the the, the particles that that somehow you know uh, make the phenomena what they are. Um, and Descartes, you know, in his as I remember in his optics, there's a passage where he's describing how to make telescopes. And then he writes, you know, that we could also make a telescope made to study minute things. Uh, this was before there was, you know, a word for the microscope. And he says, you know, that, that telescope <laughs> would be, would prove even more, you know, interesting and promising than those we have already, because it would, 
you know, it would reveal to us why a rainbow looks the way it looks and, and such things. So it would, you know, it would show the fundamental makeup of, of natural phenomena. And I think that idea is some is is one that that power is really just like latching onto. Um, um, and it 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 just it just um takes up a lot of space in his linking, I think. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, let me just jump in real quickly to, to come at it from a slightly different direction too, that picks up on something Dana said about the more regimented form of the experimental philosophy as it's published and the sort of diminution of the metaphysical questions or commitments that you might otherwise find in Cartesianism. It strikes me that that, I mean, I would want to massage that point a little bit. So one of the ways in which I think the Cartesianism sort of enters is going to be in this idea that there's a uniformity in nature where scale and effect doesn't really matter. That what you find in the visible world is precisely what you'll find in the subvisible world. And that sort of encourages uh, us to look and it encourages us to see analogies and to associate what we will find with the microscope with what we see in the visible world. And that's entirely supported by Descartes' metaphysical apparatus. I mean, uh, so that's one element of it. And I think another element that it might not seem quite as robustly metaphysical, but it's certainly a part of the story in my mind, at least, is the role of visualization in general. So even when the microscope is not available, Descartes, you know, Luthi and others have talked about this, that he's still struggling to visualize the subvisible world, that that's really, it's not about touching it or tasting it or all the other senses, it's about visualization. Um, and of course, Descartes isn't the first to sort of draw an image of a corpuscle. Uh, Bakeman, for example, in the journal, in his journal did it, and Descartes may have even derived some of his ideas from Bakeman on this stuff. But that idea of visualization strikes me as another place where it, there's a kind of metaphysical underpinning or a methodological underpinning to the way science is meant to be done that draws on Descartes. Descartes might not be the only source, but of course, visualization is hugely important in his story. And it's part of why there's limited properties that we you know, look for and attribute to the phenomena of nature in our explanations. Just a quick, far too long of a, of a, of a you know, addition. So thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Dolores, I was about to ask if you you wanted to jump in here. So I want to jump in here too. So um, I'd like to follow up on some of Gideon's points. Um, um, but I, I wanted to also say, Donna, about um, framing this question. I like the um, non-rigid way in which you're thinking about this, that um, there's some, uh, that power is somehow at the intersection of Cartesianism and Baconianism, um, which, which isn't um, fully worked out in, in let's say, Europe at, at, in, this, in the middle of the 17th century. And um, one way of thinking about um, why it's not worked out is, is because there are a lot of things going on in medicine and in theoretical philosophy that are just in the air and that people are asking questions about. And one, one of the sources that everyone is reading is Lucretius because of the, um, um, the revival of um, atomism and Descartes and uh, Henry Power and Bacon and uh, Newton, even, even I.B. Cohen's um, uh, wonderful article on Newton and Lucretius is, um, is informative. So I just wondered whether or not you, th you might think it's helpful to back up and think about um, the pre-sources of um, what power is, is reading and what is available to Descartes. And I was trying to think of, is there a Dutch version? And of course, um, um, Gideon um, brings up Regius, but there, there's, there's also Henricius and, and Beekman. Um, and it seems as it seems as if we get out of this idea of the silos of information that are just Cartesian or just Baconian, it's much more helpful to think about how messy things were in this period. Um, I don't know if that's a helpful re remark, but it, it does it does right. show that that our historiography might be really off, and there might be two reasons for this because I've thought a lot about this. 
two reasons for it might be just the curriculum. You know, the way in which we teach Descartes or we teach Bacon has to be done in a sort of siloed um, set of references because we, we don't want to confuse the students and, and make, you know, just give them a mess. And when you when you look at the curriculum of the way Bacon's been taught and the way Descartes's been taught, it's really very much in this silo of information. And um, so this is not a problem that's you know unique to um, early modern philosophy. It's a it's it's a general problem about how we have to have clarity about the silos of information. And I th I think um, Gideon's question about when we're talking about Cartesianism, who are we talking about? Um, goes straight to that point. Yeah, no, I think, thank you for this. Uh, it's very important to mention, I think, that in Henry Powers library, of which we have a list, there's an inordinate number of Lucretius works, at least three, four, maybe Christopher knows better, and four copies of Lucretius, different copies of Lucretius. And if so, I may jump in, manuscript 1346, uh, mentions at least two editions, one in Porto and another one in Porto. So my kind of question for Christopher would be whether the atoms are actually not the seminarium of Lucretius, point blank. I mean, Henry Power's atoms. I mean, he's just in you know, kind of seminarium as in the rerum natura. Um, thanks, Dana. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a big expert on Lucretius, so I don't, I wouldn't want to make the, you know, I wouldn't want to say yes or no on this. Um, but what I think is interesting about the atoms, you know, I, which comes from the term atoms, is that we, it's so, I guess, um, wound up in the in the physical science, the way we see it, you know, physics, perhaps chemistry, but mostly physics, right? Uh, but I think what's important, I think this is what 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 Oana really is getting at as well, is that these are these are parts, these are generating parts, right? And as I understand Lucretius, that's also the idea here. You know that these are in, in dispersed, you know, throughout the the world, and there they will find a place, and they will then you know grow to become to become other things. And I think that's that's what atoms really are to, to power. Then he makes, of course, the distinction between, um, you know, what I call atom seeds, you know, generative parts in a more biological sense. And then, you know, when he talks about the effluviums of the lodestone, for instance, it is as if and that he's talking about those being kind of different. Um, um, they, they, at least they seem to him to be much smaller, so he's not very optimistic about being able to see those. So it seems that he is making distinction, distinctions between different classes of at atoms, but the but the um, class of generative atoms is really big to him. Um, and I guess, I don't know, it, that might ring a bit Lucretian, um, yeah. But it's, it's not just generative atoms, is it? It's um, because it, um, th they're all interested in gener not just generation, but putrefaction, concoction, maturation, vivification. So it seems to me that the matter theory turns into a kind of um, a query, query, not just about um, matter, but about the physiology of matter and living bodies. I don't know, Dan, that, that probably, um, but- Dan has a finger. <laughs> Go on. Yes, I have a number of fingers, but uh, to 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 enter into the discussion that uh, questions that uh, that Gideon um, and Dolores uh, raised. First of all, I think um, I'm surprised that uh, you know when we're talking about Lucretius, when we're talking about animism and the sources, Gassendi hasn't been mentioned. Gassendi was certainly uh, you know available and um, important. Um, um, in England um, um, at the time that that, that power is writing, um, and um, you know the Ahmed Versiones and the Syntagma were certainly readily available to um, um, to people and certainly read. Um, um, this was, I think, you know, one of the, one of the 
<laughs> I, I, I certainly do not agree with everything that Dmitry Levitin wrote in his big book, but one of the things that he did point out is the importance of dissent at that point. Um, and as far as Cartesianism and the image of Cartesianism and uh, the way in which we teach it, part of the reason why it is that people, students, not to mention certain um, um, uh, perhaps scholars, don't see Cartesianism in the kinds of things that Power is talking about is because one thinks of Cartesianism in terms of, well, certainly when you're talking to your undergraduate students in terms of things like the cogito and the proof of the distinction of mind and body, it's not that big part that's at issue in, um, um, in Power's experimental philosophy. It's of course the natural philosophy and, and you know, parts three and four of the Principia that are, um, um, you know, certainly very well, as, as well as uh, uh, the medical writings that were certainly available um, uh, by that time, that are to a different audience, the center of what Cartesianism means, as opposed to the, to the more metaphysical part that um, has survived in, in uh, uh, classroom presentations, if you will. But that's just an observation and not then where would you question. look for gas where would you look for gas and d because one thing that speaks against gas and d is that power in the pneumatic experiments that we didn't talk about is very much against void and very much in favor of cartesian ether yeah. um, and also in terms of magnetism he also talks very much in in terms of effluvia, Cartesian effluvia, and very much. Well, no, 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 look, I'm not suggesting that there isn't a very strong... No, I mean, the point is, where, where would you look well. for it? Would you look for it in terms of, in this, this terms of Lucretian seeds, or...? Exactly, Lucretian seeds, atoms, I, yeah, I, Descartes does not, uh, um, well, um, Gassendi does talk about um, the void, which, um, Descartes does not. On the other hand, Descartes does not talk about atoms. Or if he does talk about atoms, he explicitly denies them. It's not a term that 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 um, uh, he uses in any sort of sympathetic way. Um, and if you're talking about uh, what opportunistic, what well, what was your term, Donna? A disciplined opportunist. Oh, right. Disciplined opportunist. He can, you know, in a disciplined way, borrow from both Gassendi and from Descartes. Now, I do not deny that, that there's, you know, obviously a Cartesian element there, too. No, I mean, I absolutely, you're absolutely right. I was just trying to figure out where and how. He did have Charlton in his library, so yeah. I, would, I would put Charlton as the first uh, probably before no, but, but presumably he can read Latin and the works are no, very no, he did, he did. but the point is he is quoting some sources and it's very important yeah. what kind of sources he's quoting yeah. and actually the Lucretian source where he quotes I mean how power quotes Lucretius in the experimental philosophy but he quotes Lucretius very uh, via a very interesting source which is Thomas Muffet on insects and Thomas Muffet is an Ethan author who was actually influencing Bacon himself. So probably the Silva on insect is from Muffet. But that thing remained in manuscript. And I mean, Muffet and Bacon were in the same circle of Essex circle and so on. But Thomas Muffet's Theatrum Insectorum was not published until late in the 1636. And it was published by Theodore de Mayern, famous doctor, probably Bacon's doctor as well. Um, and, and, and Moffat is quoted both on the title page of the experimental philosophy and in various parts where he talks about insects, locusts, for example. And there he quotes Lucretius via Moffat. So the point is that I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put Gassundi as the atomistic whatever. It's, it's, it's earlier than that. Maybe you know you know the text much better than I do. 
But I would look yeah, around. On the other hand, of course, I mean, I, he, he clearly, if we take him to be a disciplined opportunist, I don't see why he wouldn't take Gassendi and, and as well as Brown, as well as Brown and Bacon and Descartes, and yeah. Now, I mean, Gassendi is Gassendi is is claiming to be representing Epicurus. His interest in Lucretius is as a source for Epicurean ideas. Wait, um, Bill has been waiting a long time, I think. Oh, uh, I'd just say uh, Boyle is the same way. He, he uh, when he needs to make his point in Cartesian terms, he does. When he needs to make it uh, in Baconian points, he, in Baconian terms, he does. And uh, he just, he didn't see a real big distinction between them. Um, but yeah, the the question I had was just for Christopher, and it's more of a clarification. Um, just whether he would consider uh, this definition of Adam like an operational definition of Adam, in the sense that it, you know, what counts as an Adam right now with current technology might not be an Adam in the future when microscopic technology advances. Cheers. Thank, thank you, Bill. Um, and thanks for uh, a great presentation. You're very welcome. Um, thanks. Um, I, I think it's very operational in the sense that, you know, he's using it in, um, in, in different ways. You know, for instance, um, he would talk about eyes of grasshoppers and he would say they are atoms. Um, and he would say, you know, he also talks about the lily powder and he calls them atoms, the, the little little granules of lily powder um, or pollen. Um, he will also talk about mercury blobs um, that he kind of like, um, you know, tears apart as much as he can. And then we say, uh, here we have an atom of mercury. So it seems to be a very fluent, I guess that's a sympathetic way of saying it, a very fluent term to him. Um, which, which See, that's, that, that's actually very similar to uh, Boyle. Boyle's conception of uh, chemical atom, at, at least uh, according to Ben Chevy Robno's work, um, where it's this operational conception that, that can change over time, but it allows him to treat atom, chemical atoms, you know, the things we can break down the most in the chemical laboratory, uh, treating them as an operational definition allows him to treat them as natural kinds in a way that uh, Descartes, it's not clear he could do something like that. But uh, yeah, I just found it really interesting. Great. Um, I still, I still think there is a difference, although I'm perhaps struggling to see just exactly what it is. But when Boyle talks of clusters of corpuscles, I mean these these aggregates that that are simple but have qualities that are different from, I guess, their lowest lowest form. Um, I think it's different than when Henry Power is speaking about atoms because. Atoms seem also to him to be some sort of like the threshold of, of analysis in some way, you know, and then he says, you know, it is, for instance, the seed, if, if we take the seed to be an atom, it is structured, but you can't go beyond or beneath or like further down in that structure. What, what this structure will do is it will magnify, it will, you know, in, it will enlarge and grow bigger. So in that sense, it is the smallest unit. Um, oh, that's, that's just fascinating. Uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you both. Um, further questions? May I, may I Oops. jump in just a little bit here? Because oh, yeah, go on. For instance, yeah, about the operational way in which uh, uh, power uses atoms, uh, I completely agree that um, you know, it is used in order to explain generation and not necessarily as the last division, of, the ultimate division of matter. Well, uh, you have this, let's say, um, understanding of atoms as the last division of matter and of bodies as machines, but on the other hand, Atoms are of two kinds, right? Grosser atoms, which can be seen by the microscope, and you have effluvia, which are also made of atoms of a subtle nature this time. And when he speaks about effluvia and subtle atoms, sometimes he calls them particles. Again, so I, I wanted to add to the operational use of atoms in certain contexts. So yeah, if you can see atoms now and seeds, which are 
of course, grosser kind of atoms, perhaps in the future, we will be able to go further on and see how subtle atoms look like. Great, thank you, Juana. Um, any other questions? Oh, uh, Gideon. I'm sorry, I, I have a question that's always puzzled me and it's puzzled me about Descartes. It's puzzled me about all these figures who talk about animal spirits and, um, sorry, my son is behind me making noise. Uh, the the animal spirits are the, the subtle matter. So. One of the things subtle matter can do is it can go anywhere, interpenetrate or penetrate almost anything, right? So how is it that it stays contained within any fluid or system so that it can serve a prolonged functional role? Um, Descartes doesn't have a good story about this. Like how do the valves in the veins stop animal spirits? Wouldn't they just zoom right through them and out of the body? Um, does power say anything about how these things stay where they're meant to be inside of the different systems? Neutrinos actually do that. What's that? I didn't mean to interrupt, but new, neutrinos uh, are really small subatomic particles. They actually do that. They they don't seem to cause anything. They just go right through it. Yeah, but the animal spirits obviously have pretty significant roles to play in most of these uh, living systems, right? Well, that, that was precisely my point, that here he's Cartesian, he's a Baconian and not Cartesian. And when he contemplates a Cartesian answer, then the answer is they don't. They can't, that continuously emanate from the body. So the body is like a hydraulic machine that continuously produces animal spirits that are living the body. Which means that I'm kind of in a pro. I'm, I'm just a tube through which matter enters in one hand, animal spirits go in the other, and and therefore there is this. There are all these problems of identity and individuation. Animal spirits never stay in a body, and they are continuously produced in the universe. And this simply doesn't work. That's that's you know in a Cartesian framework, this doesn't work. Uh -huh. yeah? Sorry. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, matter can aggregate and matter can be broken down. That seems to be part of the story of the animal spirits in Descartes. He does talk about, um, and again, it's the treaties on man, so it's not available to power at this time. But Descartes does talk about um, the animal spirits leaving the body through persper in insensible perspiration, a la like Centaurus and before. Um, but he also has them doing something interesting within the fluid itself. It's as though they still kind of bounce around and stay inside the body. Um, and the experiment that I had mentioned earlier about Regis, it's an experiment about the circulation of the animal spirits. So it's not just the blood that circulates. Regis concocts these experiments to confirm the circulation of the animal spirits. And those experiments are specifically noted by powers. Um, in a positive way, right? It's the slug experiment. I gave a talk about this in. Bucharest. By the way, oh, I, I want, I want to, I want the, I want your talk. Um, this is another thing that doesn't get into the published version. So, in the published version, you have the slug experiment as the only experiment in which animal uh, spirits circulate, and they seem to be circulating on the outside of the slug, not on the inside of the slug. And in the in some of the manuscript, he had more examples of the circulation, and he seems to take it as a for granted that animal spirits also circulate where blood circulates, and that doesn't make it into the uh, published version. And I I was wondering why, but now if you bring Regius into the discussion, and he clearly had Regius in the in his library, I think that's probably you're probably right. That's that's what it is about. I mean, Charlton, for what it's worth, also repeats that experiment and publishes it. Um, Newton similarly repeats the slug experiments in his Cambridge notebooks. So it's it's widely known um, in the period, the slug, the slug experiment, yeah. as I like to call it. Yeah. Dan? Yeah, just just a, a finger on, on Regis and um, his distribution in England. I was just looking at the third edition, the 1661 edition of the Philosophia Naturalis. And guess who it's dedicated to? 
Charles II of England. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. I had never noticed that before. But but you know, it it could be significant. Uh, it it could suggest that um he knew that he had a following in uh, um, in England at that point. It was published, of course, in Amsterdam by the Elzevirs, but uh, dedicated to Charles II, who in 1661, of course, had just been restored. That's so the had just been restored. Thank you. This is very useful. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great. Awesome. Um, any. Sorry, one uh, oh yeah. Yeah, may I say something going back to Vivian's last point or? Great, yeah. Yeah, perhaps the last point, but <laughs> one of the last of his points. So uh, about subtle matter, subtle matter does not stay actually. It is at least in Powers case and as far as I know in Bacon's case too, subtle matter is, a con is in a continuous motion motion in the sense of struggle to uh, unite with its connatural in the universe. So in power, you have three cases of fixation, fusion, and volatilization, I mean. And this is how he explained like, what you have in nature is, I mean, different bodies are uh, um, actually, um, let's say, embodiments of this continuous struggle of subtle matter to unite with its connectural in, in different stages. So in fixation, you have subtle matter, which is unable to escape from its grosser matter, and so on and so forth. So you have this continuous process of, I don't know, generation, let's say, that starts with the seed and ends, at least in the case of plants, to the formation of a new seed. But again, it is a continuous and perpetual process. So subtle matter does not stay. It always, it's restless. So it's always in a kind of battle. Great, thank you. That was helpful. All right, um, any concluding thoughts or questions? Well, if not, I think we can thank our panelists. Um, and from uh, slugs and perspiration, I think we will move on to Descartes metaphysics next time. Um, so hope to see you all there. All right, take care. Ciao. Thank you.